video. Start video. Recording. Admit. See waiting room. Admit. Udah kok kirim ya? Masih aja dulu. Admit. Hi Martha, hi James. Can you hear me? Your microphone still on mute. Yeah, okay. Is it okay now? It is, it is. We are admitting people. So far, we have two people joining us. Okay. Um. Hi, Sami. How are you? Can I present anything? Let's see. I have some documents over here, but not, not yet. Not yet. Uh, the order of presentation is. I will present first, and then you, Martha, and James last. And we still have four minutes. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. I was just wondering how to post the things. Oh, you can share screen. Share screen. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me, let me, here we go. Let me, let me allow, uh, okay. Yeah, share screen, the function. Uh, middle yep. button. Yep. I know about that. I just, does it work now? Okay, good. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. Let me know if this works for you. Yeah, it's small. It is on your, you're on your phone, yeah? Uh, no. What about this? Can you see this? Uh, we can see it, but it is small, but it's fine, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. You should you should uh click the uh box on the right top right corner so that it's bigger. Oh yeah, okay, this one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So when the time comes that's what I'll do. Exactly. Okay. James, your voice is still not uh switch on, yeah? Can you switch on your voice, James? <coughs> Hi, James. Yeah, your voice, your speaker, you should click on the left uh bottom corner the mute button yep can you hear me now yes yes yeah. yes yes okay. could you see my i tried to share the screen too i've got i have to shut down a lot of things i've got on on this screen so that i can you don't need to you just need to uh share screen and then uh, choose the screen choose the window that you're sharing you don't need to shut down anything okay um can you see if I've I've shared the screen now? Can you see my slides? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So you press share screen and then top left, I think. Okay, now now we can see. All right, let me yep. turn. Yep. You can see it now. You can see my slides? Uh slides uh not yes, now yes. 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 Okay, got it. All right. <coughs> That's fine then, as long as that's on. Okay. Okay, we'll start in one minute. Okay, a minute. 
back in two seconds. With Skype. So I'm going to try a uh, noise canceling uh, software, yeah, because I'm at a cafe. Okay. Kim ke semua. Ini ke WhatsApp kok. WhatsApp ya. James, James should minimize his screen. I think that's all I see right now. <laughs> yeah, James, you can unshare your screen for now because I'm going to start soon. Yep, I'm here, I'm here. Sorry, mea culpa, mea culpa. Yeah, just disconnect the sharing okay. screen function. Okay, so do I need to do anything? Uh, you should stop sharing screen. Stop sharing screen, how do yeah. I do that? Um, hold on. How do I do that? Uh, very simple. Back to the share button and then stop sharing. Back to the, all right, let me set that off. Share button. Where is the, ah, ah you are screen sharing, stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Done. Okay, okay. so uh, let me, let me uh, start, yeah? Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, bear in mind that I'm, uh, installing a noise cancelling software which is ongoing i'm not sure where it goes <laughs> let me see alt tap alt tap alt tap alt tap alt tap zoom ini kok masuk ya kenapa masuk itu kan surya juga jangan masuk kau oh, april zoom ini yeah. april ya okay. Okay, uh, it seems that I can see your slides. Yeah, I'm trying to start this noise cancelling uh, thing, but it's not starting. Because I'm at a cafe, so you can hear lots of background noise noises. But I can, I can still hear your voice clearly. I don't know if everyone else can. Yeah, I can. It's all right. Fine then, I'll just start, yeah? Yeah, okay. if you punch the wrong button, we're all toast. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to start. So, let me minimize this. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone from Medan, Indonesia. Uh, my name is uh, Surya. Peace be upon you. Assalamualaikum to the Muslims in audience. Uh, today we are very lucky that we have our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Professor Martha Beck from Lion College and Dr. Uh, James Campbell from Asia Aware, uh, a consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia, I think. And today our topic is uh, Islamic and Western universities, uh, idea, institution, and impression. Uh, we are supposed to have another speaker, Professor uh, Shahrin Harahab, uh, but uh, I have been trying to, he was the one actually who suggested to have this event, to have this webinar, but uh, uh, he, I think, uh, uh, on Tuesday, I think I met him for four hours in Medan, but the next day, Wednesday, I think he went to Jakarta because he is being selected as a candidate for uh, the leader, the rector, the president of uh, a university that I'm advising, which is the State Islamic University for North Sumatra, which Prof Beck has visited once uh, some time back. Yeah? I hope you remember your visit, Prof Beck. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Okay. Definitely. So uh, I told uh, both the uh, if if you want to add anything, if any of in the audience or 
any of the speakers want to add anything, you can uh, just chat, yeah, use the chat function and just say whatever you want to say because I might forget uh, some things, yeah, some administrative things or some anything. You can just use the chat function and I'll see it and I'll uh, 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 answer it, yeah? I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll try to uh, accommodate your requests or whatever you want, yeah? So I'm going, I, I told the two professors, the two, the two uh, distinguished speakers that I'm going to uh, try uh, to present a bit on what Professor Shahrin is supposed to present, but it's only a bit, yeah? basically he wrote a book which is relevant to our conversation. I hope you can see. I have uh, his book here, and I also have uh, James' book here. Yeah, and uh, so I'm going to try to, uh, but it's not much of a try because I only have one slide concerning that, and I'm going to explain uh, very uh, briefly. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to install this noise cancelling thing. Uh, okay, so now back to my slides. I'm going to, uh, as a moderator for today, my name is Surya Delimonte, I told you, and later you're going to know a lot more about me, lots of slides about me, uh, on my impression on Western and Islamic universities, as well as some idea for current and future institutions. Uh, so I have been affiliated as a student with the National University of Singapore, which I entered in 2002 and graduated in 2008. So six years, not an ordinary amount of time to be in an university, longer by two years in fact. And I was involved in a lot of activities, uh, necessitating the lengthy, the length, the extended length of uh, university uh, for undergraduate education, and then. I joined uh, UINSU, Universitas Islam Negeri Sumatera Utara, State uh, Islamic University of North Sumatra, uh, first as a master's student, and I have completed the master's degree. Uh, it took uh, a decade, 10 years, as always, as usual, because I was uh, more involved in uh, non-academic uh, activities at the university, for, ex for example, advising uh, their transformation from a small college to a large uh, university they are now. And after that, for a brief period of time, four months, I was at ICDOR, more on ICDOR later. And uh, unofficially, I started this thing called I3. Yeah? Uh, uh, in essence, it is an abbreviation for Indonesian Independent Intellectual. Uh, so uh, those uh, people who likes to think, who likes to write, uh, and who likes to be independent, not attached to any institution. And that's my email. If you want to, if any of you want to email me, yeah. So we're gonna have four main uh, uh, discussion, four main uh, subtopics, yeah. First, the introduction, a bit on Prof. Shahrin, and then uh, I'm going to uh, uh, share. Uh, a bit information about Ikdor and Ronin, two institutions for independent research, which I think is uh, a good direction for any any higher education institution today. Yeah, and last but not least, the issues of funding. Uh, as you know, research, a scholarship, scientific activities requires lots of funding, and this is where I think uh, uh, we are at a loss the most today. So. Yeah, so I'm educated, as I told you before, in Western and Islamic countries. Uh, since this is a bit of my background, that's my website. Uh, I created this in 2009, and this is my history here. So uh, I had three primary school degrees, three or four uh, secondary school degrees, and uh, two or three, I attended two or three main universities, yeah? in addition to LSE and Columbia, but I only spent a little time in those places. So as you can see, uh, most of my education uh, was conducted or I got most of my education from Western universities. The only supposed, supposed I say supposed, uh, because uh, even though I think 
a lot of us will know that even though uh, uh, Winsu or EIN uh, previously was called EIN has the word Islam in the title of in, in the university, but the content of education, lots of it are virtually undistinguishable from uh, quote unquote Western universities. I think uh, uh, perhaps I'm going to elaborate on that later, maybe during Q&A section. So these are my uh, background, yeah, and I have a lot of. Uh, so in 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 2000. Eight, I graduated from NUS and lots of things happened during my undergraduate years such that by the time I graduated I, uh, I was uh, touched uh, greatly by this quote by William James yeah? because I used to have big plans when I was an undergraduate so I participated in World Bank IMF meeting I interned for INSEAD and when I was interning for INSEAD I got to be in touch with lots of important people uh, uh, from all around the world. I traveled to uh, four continents except Africa using uh, the money that I earned from summer school, yeah? Not school, summer summer jobs in Singapore. And uh, so, but something happened which changed my direction. And this is the quote that touched me the most by William James, yeah? I am done with great things and big plans, great institutions and big successes. I am for those tiny, invisible, loving human forces that work from individual to individual, creeping through the crannies of the world like so many rootlets, or like the capillary oozing of water, yet which, if given time, will rend the hardest monuments of human pride. So there was a spiritual turn to my transformation from undergraduate to postgraduate and then to independent uh, activities and scholarship, yeah? which we can if you want to ask, you can ask later during my during the Q and A. Yeah? And sorry. Yeah. So these are some of my activities. Uh, the pictures I and my wife uh, in Malaysia, I think, uh, in a very beautiful. What is the university? What is the place, April? The place for this uh, garden? No, no. This is the garden in Malaysia. Yeah, uh, it's, near, it's located on top of a uh, perhaps bird, bird, uh, bird sanctuary near the bird sanctuary in Malaysia, near the uh, Bukit Nanas, I think Bukit Nanas. Yeah, so it was a very beautiful garden. It is a very beautiful garden, and so I have been. I, I have set up a company in Singapore. It's called Rehan Private Limited. Basically, it was in the film business, and I tried to export uh, an Indonesian film. At that time, I had a cinta to Hollywood. The crisis of 2008, uh, I have uh, expended a great deal of cost. Yeah, I have spent a lot of money on it, but because of the crisis, I couldn't spend any more money. So uh, that's why I, I stopped the, the effort. And then I joined uh, Yensu, Institute Agama Islam Negeri Sumatera Utara later to become Universitas uh, Islam Negeri. So Institute is a small college. They only have four faculties. Now Universitas, uh, they have like 10 faculties. Uh, so the initial faculties were Islamic named faculties, Sharia, Dakwa, Tarbiya, and Sharia, uh, Dakwa, and Usuluddin. Yeah? And now uh, with the Universitas, they have uh, uh, mathematics and science, and uh, they expanded the Islamic faculties, Islamic sounding, Islamic name, fac based name faculties to Tarbiyah and Pendidikan, Usuluddin and uh, Islamic thought, Sharia and law, uh, Dakwah and communication. And they added mathematics and science, uh, societal health, yeah, kesehatan masyarakat, and then uh, several more uh, faculties. Uh, and these are some of my, uh, these are our websites, but uh, it's just to illustrate uh, the activities that I have been doing. So I've been involved with Open Science, which is a huge, huge, uh, 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 huge subset of uh, academic movement now, uh, Open Science. Yeah? I'm going to explain it later. And this is Indonesia Manggugat was a speech by our first president Sukarno when he was jailed uh, in the 30s, I think. Uh, basically, it demands uh, independence. 
and it says uh, you know, uh, or Indonesia accuse, accuses. That's the meaning of it. And uh, this is about reparation and all that stuff, yeah. And then the uh, macro economy, yeah. I'm doing what I'm doing right now, which is uh, uh, macroeconomics uh, on modern monetary theory and job guarantee as a policy. And then I wrote, I write lots of op-ed articles, including now I am involved in writing maybe five to ten articles, both for uh, local, uh, national, and international uh, venues, yeah. And I'm also involved in Rajin, yeah. Rajin basically is a volunteer for international uh, uh, publications. So I've involved in helping people and myself to write papers, attend conferences all over the world, yeah. And this is the newest, which is uh, ruanggurumengaji.com. Basically, in Indonesia right now, we have this online system called Ruangguru, private system, uh, which tries, I think, uh, uh, to brand itself as a new method to teach uh, conventional subjects at the level of high school and below. So I'm just adding mengaji there. Mengaji means, uh, mean, traditionally means uh, reading the Quran. So I'm just adding that if people uh, uh, can do that conventionally, they should be able to do this to learn the Quran also. Because, uh, you know, as we know, we have the COVID-19 pandemic now. So lots of physical interactions with teachers are being uh, stopped. So uh, still, these lessons need to continue, including the religious lessons uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, kids, yeah, for kids and children and junior high students, which, are, which form, I think, perhaps 100 million of Indonesian population. Uh, So uh, uh, this is our title, yeah. Islamic and Western University Idea Institution Impression. Second presentation, we're gonna have Prof. Beck from Lion College. Uh, she's going to present about. Uh, I told her that's her topic, but she's free to present around this uh, 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 main topic, yeah. And James uh, uh, on uh, uh, human university. He has this idea of an institution. Uh, to reform our current uh, uh, universities. Yeah? So this is what uh, Prof. Shahrin's uh, idea. Yeah? So Wahdatul Ulo means unity of knowledge. So currently it's the official paradigm, official uh, curriculum for uh, Winsu. Yeah? So you can see the circle. Uh, it is based on the universe and uh, human issues which can be interpreted uh, through knowledge derived from the Quran, the Hadith, the Sunnah, uh, which are divided into uh, three main, uh, two main subdivisions, which is Islamic studies, uh, this is his classification, yeah, and Islamic science. And Islamic science uh, is divided into three uh, more uh, sub, uh, uh, subgroup, which is humanities, social science, and natural science. And at the outmost, outermost layer, you have scientific uh, and uh, decision, uh, scientific findings and decisions. Yeah, and so basically the difference between studies and science, I think, is for studies uh, is uh, to describe pre-modern Islamic knowledge and for science is uh, modern knowledge. So there's a huge movement to integrate uh, modern knowledge into uh, 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 the greater uh, Islamic knowledge, yeah, using the Quran and the Sunnah as a guidance, as a filter for this modern knowledge. And uh, he has a lot of concentric circles in the book. Uh, for example, uh, I, I wanted to copy it, but because uh, it's not in color, so I didn't. So this is a very, this is inspired, if you can see the seven circles here, this is inspired from the Tawaf, or the circling of the Kaaba that you're supposed to do when you perform Hajj, yeah? Uh, so uh, that is saying that you really should be careful with knowledge. You should think through of knowledge, and so you should start with uh, 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 the aim of being scientific and objective. You should have transmission and a lot of things, yeah, which uh, uh, I can't really explain because it's uh, Prof. Shahrin's. And last but not least, he also has a character on a student, 
student character. What are students supposed to be like when uh, having graduated from this curriculum? So they are supposed to be happy. They're supposed to be pious. They're supposed to be uh, pushing for the uh, uh, advance in human civilization and a lot of a lot of other uh, purposes, other goals, other aims. Yeah. So this is uh, briefly what Prof. Shahrin uh, is uh, 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 doing now. And if he is uh, appointed rector, I think he's going to uh, strengthen or deepen this concept, which uh, Prof. Beck and uh, uh, Dr. Campbell later can advise him on. And also, uh, oh, okay, never mind that. So now, the third uh, uh, subtopic here on Igdor and Ronin. So Igdor basically is an institute for globally distributed open research and education. It's an independent research institute dedicated to improving the quality of science, science education, and quality of life for scientists, students, and their families, underline and their families, yeah? So uh, this is, uh, we have lots of, I'm part of this uh, ICDOR. I was a visiting uh, scholar, researcher, this, uh, or uh, yeah, visiting scholar or researcher in 2018 for four months from April to August 2018. And it was a very lovely place. Uh, I will show you later. And we have lots more members. This is just the top half of the website. As you can see, we have very diverse scientists and uh, uh, scholars here. Uh, this is my friend John Tennant. Unfortunately, he has passed away recently in Bali, in Bali, in in April, I think. Uh, and it's because of the pandemic. He was just recently repatriated, repatriated into the UK, and he's going to be buried on uh, 3rd of uh, August, uh, in a few days' time. Yeah, in one week's time. And yeah, this is my friend, uh, uh, the lady in the headscarf, the grey. A headscarf is from Universitas Airlangga in Surabaya, yeah. Rizky Amelia Jane, and yeah, I know a lot of people here, uh, but I'm not going to say their name one by one, yeah. So we have maybe hundreds of uh, scholars and scientists, and not all of them are independent. Uh, for this uh, ICDOR, you can have official position and still join ICDOR, yeah. But this one, the next one, Ronin, yeah, yeah. It is my understanding that for Ronin, lots of uh, the uh, research scholars are independent research scholars, meaning they are not affiliated to any research institutions, but they still do research. So they are sort of an institutional uh, home for these independent uh, researchers, scholars or scientists. Yeah, and they don't. Know, they don't. The scholars, the research scholars, need not need have need not need uh, need not need have need not have uh, an official degree. Yeah, just as long as. Uh, they show their expertise on a particular subject. I remember Rebecca, the founder of Ignore, telling me that there was a key expert in the in the institute uh, who writes about key, who research about key, presents about key, yeah? key as in key. Uh, so the Ronin Institute is devoted to facilitating and promoting scholarly research outside traditional academic research institutions. So they don't have an, an official or a physical uh, uh, space, yeah. Whereas for Ikdor, they have physical space at least in Bali, in Ubud, uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, they, they have three more, two more, uh, uh, I think, uh, official address, official addresses. One in uh, Sweden and the other one in Estonia. But I'm not sure whether they have physical spaces there. Anyway, the next one will show you. Uh, yeah, here. So in Ikdor, spirituality and nature is very much combined into the environment. Yeah. So you can see here. I'll show you uh, this thing. Uh, it's playing. Thank <laughs> you. 
See, really, IGNOR is really dedicated uh, to do this, yeah? improving the quality of science through open science, uh, science education. Uh, they are against bullying, against uh, uh, unnecessary or undeserved hierarchy, uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of negative things which is occurring in, in, in the scientific world at the moment. Yeah, uh, uh, false prestige uh, because of impact factor and all that. Also, this is really important and they're really uh, true to their words in terms of improving the quality of life for scientists, students, and fam families. So in Ignore, the space itself, you have lots of uh, area for kids to play, napping areas, and uh, they are affiliated with lots of other institutions in Ubud, which you can go and uh, relax and really recharge yourself after a really intense uh, day of research. Yeah, so I think uh, this is a model, I think. James and I have spoken that really educational institutions really need to have, you know, uh, spirituality and nature uh, as part, as a core part of the, the institution, yeah? So gardens are a must. So in Igdor, uh, I think you can see uh, paddy fields, you can see rivers and all that. But that is a special feature of Bali. But uh, if the institution has lots of funding, maybe they can create or recreate that. Okay, and this is my last uh, uh, top, uh, subtopic here. Yeah? So really, uh, educational institution, especially higher educational institution, really needs to have a high amount or lots of funding yeah, to be able to satisfy the needs of their scientists and scholars. And how do we do that? So first of all, we must be aware that a lot of countries have constitutions which state something like this. This is for Indonesia. Every person has the right to self-realization through the fulfillment of his basic needs, the right to education and to partake in the benefits of science and technology, art and culture, so as to improve the quality of his life and the well-being of mankind. So this is Article 28C of the Indonesian Constitution, yeah? UNESCO translation. I think lots of other countries also have this kind of uh, normative uh, uh, statements, yeah? And this is from uh, the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 26.2. Education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups, and shall further the activities of the United Nations for the maintenance of peace. Basically, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is all these things uh, need funding, and we are right now facing a lack of funding especially for Islamic universities in Indonesia, and I would say non-elite universities elsewhere. Like non-elite, I would say non-Ivy League or non-Oxbridge or any of the uh, high endowment universities. Yeah? So far, uh, at the moment in the pandemic, we know that lots of layoffs are occurring across the world in universities and lots of problems because of the decrease in the number of uh, foreign students. So what is the uh, solution? Yeah? Uh, I'm going to touch briefly here. So you need to know that uh, for countries with uh, 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 currency, those countries who are, uh, it, who are creating their own currency, which is most countries now, money is never a problem. So as a citizen, as a scholars, as scientists, as researchers, we should demand the state to give the appropriate amount of money to our educational institutions to actualize those ideals. So this is a huge topic, which I'm happy to uh, discuss uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I've taken up like half an hour. So these are my contacts, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, all uh, Taman Bahasa, yeah? And thanks also to my wife, Aprilia, who is sitting uh, uh, beside me. She, ha she has helped me to finish this uh, presentation also. So thank you very much, and now, I think uh, we can uh, 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 listen to Prof. Uh, Martha Beck, yeah? So Prof. Beck, uh, this is uh, uh, 20 minutes to half an hour for you, please. <clears throat> All right, so um, 
let's see, uh, 50 years ago, I was introduced to environmental issues. And I had some friends who were biologists and they live on a really low carbon footprint farm. And I started to think holistically, right? In terms of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And in terms of an ecosystem, we had friends, family friends that were building earth sheltered homes and smaller cars and you know, windows that didn't leak. And I mean, all that environmental stuff in 1968, 67. So of course it's been awful to watch the world and my country go the other way. Uh, I just read that 90% of pollution has been created in my lifetime, <laughs> which makes sense to me because I look around and everything is just fakey and it's uh, exploiting nature, exploiting human beings and on borrowed money, um, especially since Reagan. So anyway, what I got into in college um, I did not get into anything trendy. I went back to the Greeks and I had a teacher who was very Socratic. And so the view of mind, my scholarship is around the difference between mind or nous and logos. Um, so reasoning and that science. So I did um, do the Greek uh, Olympian deities, they each re represent uh, living for the sake of something greater than yourself. So I call them sacred passions. You can be passionate about them. Um, so um, Zeus and Athena are the god and goddess of justice and a just war. And Athena is the goddess of wisdom. So the idea there is we are social and political creatures by nature. We absolutely have to have social networks and political association in order to be fully human. So we have three layers of association. Bio, uh, biology or extended family is just to survive. Then you have the village, Sudzain. That is people coming together to survive more efficiently, and that's the economic sector. And then there's a completely different level of association, the polis, and that is learning how to live um, as a fellow citizen under a common body of laws. And you have to think like a citizen, right? And you have to um, think about people you don't know personally. And so this is the Greek genius. I mean, it, I think all ancient cultures, all wisdom cultures, uh, focus on wisdom, the cultivation of the mind. And if I had time to study the other ones, I would. I just happen to have focused on the Greeks, but I'll never say they're better than anybody because I don't know any other tradition well enough. So I'm not judging, I'm just admiring. <laughs> the Greeks, I think the whole culture, starting with Hesiod and uh, Homer, Delphi, the Oracle at Delphi, Olympia, they had this, this um, heightened consciousness, this sort of quantum leap, that we are the creature that by, by nature desires to understand. So as an evolutionary response to the world, we started understanding patterns and that made us very fit because the actual patterns are out there, like the universe is ordered and we can understand it. And so at a certain point, there was this recognition that we are the creature that understands. We can know ourselves as knowers. Um, a famous cartoon I have is this cow looking up with grass and going, grass, I'm eating grass. And so it's just that awareness. And then Hesiod and Homer 
tried to find as many patterns as they could in human affairs. So the struggle between good and evil, we have these instinctual drives for pleasure and fear, right? Sex and aggression. But we have to integrate those into culture. We have to find a way to connect those to all our higher order um, living ways of being social and political and intellectual creatures. So Aristotle was actually a biologist and he was a teleological biologist. And that has been in the modern era that was thrown out. Even Whitehead said you threw away the baby with the bathwater. Um, the new paradigm systems thinking, uh, holistic thinking, you never should have thrown out the, the insights of ancient wisdom, and you should not have thrown out the mind, the training of the mind, wisdom, as the ultimate goal. Um, the god Apollo is the god of reason, and he, he represents science, math, technology, also the calculating the most efficient means to your goals, whatever they are your capacity for speech, persuasive speech, uh, your capacity to produce things, all of that is, you might call left-brained. It's just Apollonian. Apollo himself was emotionally immature. He chased nymphs in his spare time, so his relation to women was immature. And also, he was indifferent to justice. So... He started out on the correct side in the Trojan War, but they got so disorganized that he moved over to the other side because Hector was very organized and unified. So the character type nowadays is in our whole education system. So in the Enlightenment in the West, there was an absolutely deliberate, self-conscious, totally on board, throwing out of ancient wisdom the mind and replacing that with reason. So both the rationalists, the empiricists, they disagreed with each other, but they all agreed to keep wisdom out of it, okay? Well, it didn't work, okay? And it was, the modern era was founded on treating nature like silly putty and then using it for human well-being and then treating the human psyche like silly putty, a blank slate, and using social science to socially engineer people out of all those vices. And that just hasn't worked. It's always been a lie. But when I first was exposed, I really liked the notion of the pride or sin. The greatest evil is to overstep your bounds. So you have a certain place in the universe to understand it. And then you should develop cultures that integrate, you know, sustainable societies. And so they understood that, like Demeter is the goddess of the earth. You don't mess with her. If you mess with her, she'll starve you out. And Poseidon is the god of the winds and the hurricanes. And, you know, you don't mess with these gods because they're more powerful than you. So anyway, all those stories about the deities are archetypes, they're patterns, and they represent sacred aspects of our life, right? And so there's Apollo in his place. When he's kept in his proper place, he's fine, but he has to be guided by, by wisdom, and um, then there's Ares, the god of war, and Athena is always telling him to stop being so brutal, right? The wars only are for the right reason in the right way. Anyway, I could go on, but I mean, every story I tell this, my students get it right away. So Aristotle's model is a biological model. Happiness is flourishing. It's body, mind, and spirit. You know, the Olympics, a sound mind in a sound body. So happiness is a kind of flourishing. It, it, the Greek word is eudaimonia. And so each one of those goddesses and gods is a daimon, okay? A daimon is something that possesses you. Like when a student comes into my office and they say, but people don't understand 
how much, you know, little kids, how whatever comes after, people don't understand that. <laughs> I'd say that's probably your calling. That's the thing. People need everything. You know, society needs everything. And whatever it is that strikes you, that's what you enjoy doing and what the world needs, that's your calling. And that's what you should get the credentials. But I agree with Surya that our educational system is rotten. <laughs> I mean, it really, it assumes that the modern Western world was right. And it just keeps going on after that. And so I think we need to return to the insights of the old wisdom traditions and realize that just take what's good about them. Obviously, you wouldn't want the sexism or I wouldn't be here, but you have to look at the definitions, the theories, the stories, the insights and gain that wisdom. So, so we are a creature whose destiny is to understand uh, we're born with the potential, um, but we have to, virtue is the actual exercise of this capacity. And it's in relation to some aspect of a complete human life. Um, so self-control in relationship to eating, drinking, sex. So each culture varies in what it considers acceptable, but Every culture has some sort of limitations and expectations, right? Because that's the human condition. Each culture has a different variation, but it's on the same theme. And then courage is relation to fear. And there's lots of things we fear. Uh, because we are creatures of culture, we fear in a ability to function in our economic system, whatever our culture has defined that as, and then social ostracism because we're social by nature. So there's a lot of things to fear other than just pain or death. Uh, generosity is very important. And this was the two most important virtues for a healthy polis, our self-control and generosity and actually Aristotle just flat out said it's money um, because it's, you have to want to be middle class, no more, no less. And if you make more, you give away magnanimity for the well-being of the polis, people as a whole. Because it's only within a polis that people, in order to create a high quality of polis, political association, you have to have middle class and relatively, you have to have the largest possible, most stable middle class. Each society at any point in time, that will be a different standard of living. But a lot of it has to do with just being middle. So you don't create animosity between the rich and the poor. If you're generous, people trust you. The, the foundation for the polis, you have to have trust and goodwill, right? Citizens trust each other and they trust that they have goodwill for each other. They care about each other's well-being. Okay, not getting too angry, not taking revenge. These are personal vices that flood, that poison the social and political life. But they're, you know, they're both. So every personal virtue or vice you have has a ripple effect. There's no real split between private and public. That's another lie of modernity. Um, rational ambition, so you find out what you, your sense of calling is, you get the piece of paper, and then always whatever expertise or authority you have, justice means ruling for the sake of the well-being of the ruled. So this can apply to parenting, friendships, um, it uh, coaching, mentoring, teaching, doctor, lawyer, any business. It's always rule for the benefit of the ruled. Okay, you never take your advantage and use it to help your friends and family. Uh, the vices are greed, uh, uh, self indulgence, um, power, or glory status. Those are the worst. Vices, they're never going to go away because 
they're related to those basic drives and also to our reality as social and political. So because there's always authority, people are unequal in their abilities and in their training and in their expertise. So there's always that potential to, for power, just to use that to become, to get more and more centralized power or wealth. Um, pride is this is when you have an honors day at institutions. You're honoring people who go above and beyond just doing their job, you know, filling out the check sheet, and they make for a quality of life. Uh, sense of humor is keeping everything in perspective. So you want to take serious things seriously, but you shouldn't take yourself so seriously. You have to let go a little bit. And then you have to have good friendships. Uh, the whole tradition is dialectical. You really learn how to be virtuous or you actually exercise virtue is an inner dialogue of the soul with itself. And then it's also very closely connected to the dialogues you're having with the people who you're talking to, like your intimates, your ability um, to actually tell people what you think and then they correct you or they ask you questions that help you figure out, well, what is best in this situation? Um, sociability, and then truthfulness, like know yourself and avoid pride, right? Don't think you know what you don't know. <laughs> that Socrates is always saying that. Okay. In the political virtues, this is the economic sector. And when, when I read neoliberalism, what I, what's happening is that they are trying to make the world into a village. They're trying to claim that the profit motive can create culture. And that is an absolute lie. And Plato and Aristotle, the Greeks said, greed is the political evil. Uh, it's just because it splits the rich and the poor. The rich always money sticks to money. And so the Iliad is named after Troy. Troy is Ilia. And that was the wealthiest city, right? And they started the war. So you know, it's like these neoliberals, they also claim to read the classics, which just really annoys me. Uh, but anyway, it's the opposite. It's just like the Bible, the way they pervert it. They absolutely turn it upside down. And most people don't know that they turned the classics upside down. They know that they're turning the Bible upside down. Um, so knowing how to make laws that are most likely to promote a middle class, how to distribute wealth or social goods like education and healthcare, they know how to allocate resources. And, there, and for Aristotle, there's no logos of virtue. There isn't any recipe like the utilitarian principle or a Kantian principle. Because Aristotle says, a person's character determines what principle they think applies in a situation and how to apply it. And so character is really important. Character and dialogue. So there's an exa there are examples in the tragedies, but one of them is Agamemnon. And he comes back from having been gone to the war and he sees his counselors and he says, you have to tell me everybody that did something nasty while I was gone because we have a zero tolerance policy. And the counselor said, well, you should cut them a little slack, you know? You've been gone 10 years, just you know, have a little grace period justice tempered with mercy and it turns out his wife stabs him to death in about 10 minutes she decided to have a zero tolerance policy you know she really should have forgiven him for stabbing for killing their daughter and all this stuff so but it's just the idea is that there's all this irony constantly you know people think they're virtuous and the audience sees that oh my god he's not and so you learn how to think critically and so the art, so in a dialectical tradition, art, the artists are the educators because they connect reasoning to emotions and a way of life and critical thinking, right? You don't split science 
science is not the detached observer, right? Everybody is an engaged citizen. And so when you had a scientific theory, you wrote a poem about it because you wanted people to be in love with the universe that they're studying and they want people to respect it, right? And not to overstep your bounds. So character is very much a part of science, right? Apollo, he's got to be guided by um, uh, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Um, how to distribute wealth, how to rectify wrongs. Um, and so these are just the patterns. Aristotle says every society has a realm of political association where this is going on. And then if when I teach this to students, they go, well, yeah, you know, you read the newspaper, you're always reading about these things. So I can give them Aristotle's list and then they can systematize it and they can see how it's all interrelated. Um, so practical wisdom, the art of deliberation. Okay, the object of wish, the ultimate goal is flourishing. So a person knows how to talk, talk a situation through. What are the possible options and we're not going to say perfection is possible, or we're not going to be too cynical, we're not going to be too idealistic. We're going to, what are the real options? And then you pick one and run it through and argue, you know, you have to have a good argument for why this one is better than that one, right? But that's all he can say. He can't say he's not an ideologue, right? It's just you take a situation. So in the art, you have examples of situations where people are deliberating and you can look and see that guy's got it wrong, you know, and that guy's got it wrong. And he, most of them are wrong. And every once in a while, somebody gets it right. But that's how you learn you do art and then experience and then conversation and self-examination, examining other people. That was the big Greek thing. Um, and then you have our other capacities, right? And this, and the producing things, that's the economic sector, and then creating products, okay. But here's the intellectual virtues, and this is what you get in higher education, right? Math, science, uh, language study. Um, so, so for the Greeks, that definitely comes after character development, within the context of character development, Aristotle says a young person who's been trained as a, has the character traits, they really benefit from education, but a bad person can use all that language of virtue and all those intellectual powers to do great harm. And so the most evil people in the Greek poetry and the Greek art are smart people who want money and power. Um, so just being smart or just having, you know, an education is not um, the way, is not virtue and it's not going to do a society uh, good. So let's see, I, I have a couple other things. Um, all right, so I also connect this to the United Nations like you do, um, the capabilities approach. And this was Martha Nussbaum when she was living with Amarta Zen, who got a, a Nobel Prize in economics for the capabilities approach. And so she has a book out about women and development. And she, this is her list. And she noticed that it was very Aristotelian. And so I, I write a lot of stuff about that. The problem there, and this is, you know, it's gotta be addressed that the, that the economic stuff is number 10, part B. And so what's happened in globalization is number 10, part B is number A1, right? And, you know, anything else, you know, is up to people, but money is number one. And so it's an absolute 180 in terms of the economic system and the quality of life system. And we, we need to be aware of that and figure out what to do. And also higher education should not be the slave of, the, of money. Um, and these people are trying to create a whole international culture 
with the foundation on money and greed as a virtue. You know, higher education really has to call them out on that. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. So I, I see comparisons between Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad. And um, so the other thing I do that is compare Confucius. Let's see. Socrates has all those Aristotelian virtues. Socrates, Jesus, Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, and Gandhi. And it's really a no-brainer. Like, the students get this. And also, what I, you know, I'm always telling them to think about it in your own life. Think about people you know. They have these character flaws. Think about an example of some event. They, there's no problem. Um, it's not difficult, and the language is not difficult. That's another thing is higher ed has filled with jargon. And by the time you get through the jargon, it's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, either I disagree with it, or why didn't you just use English? Like, why don't you use these simple words and get straight to the point? Um, and then I did, I was, I had a Fulbright in Indonesia, and so I got some editorials. So this is a one by an education person, and he, I think he's the one that advocated Whitehead, but it's holistic learning, you know, and I'm, what I did when I was there for, I read the Panchasila, and what I knew right away is that Indonesians need to think in terms of these classical virtues, because that's the bridge between those official state religions, right? And then the, the secular, some of the best and brightest are taught this modern Western secular bullshit, actually. And, and so they're always throwing a wrench in there. But if they could just think of God as nature and think of what I call spiritual humanism, right? Don't throw wrenches in holistic thinking. Just figure out, you know, make your peace with it. Um, and if you just use the expression spiritual um, humanism, right? And it's consistent with secular humanism. I mean, I have a whole section where you write the whole history of humanism and the humanist manifestos, 1933, 73, 203. And they get more and more animosity and more and more of a driver between science and religion but it really has to stop. <laughs> and it's not faithful to what's going on in the world. Um, it's more and more dysfunctional. And then we did, I did start, I did teach in ben, Bandung, I mean, no, Bangladesh this spring. And I taught women, the Asia University for Women, and they're from 18 different countries. Um, it was just incredible. But they really liked this class because they, they came from all these different traditions. One of them, she said, I hate clerics. <laughs> she was from Afghanistan and she had demonstrated in some of the anti-Taliban and she had almost gotten killed. And so she was so anti-religion, but she's in, a, she's in a small group with another girl who comes from some weird Islamic sect that, you know, had some leader and he got oppressed and all this stuff, which is fine, you know. And then there were Buddhists and there were from kids from China. So when we got to these virtues, they could just talk to each other. And that was basically the foundation of the school. It's just so amazing that these schools are founded on these virtues and they never talk about them. And nobody in the school even knows about them. And so I... I, you know, I really enjoyed my time there, and they liked me. The students liked me, and uh, it was very rewarding because it's very frustrating here in the U.S., right? I'm marginalized, I'm beaten up, I'm humiliated. I'm <laughs> I mean, I went through that in order to get the degree and get tenure. Um, but once you get out, there's this incredible need for, um, for just humanistic virtues and i would say 
spiritual humanism in the sense of living for the sake of something greater than yourself. People need meaning and purpose in life. And I, I've done a lot with Carl Jung's psychology. Um, but anyway, I guess my main point is the notion of spiritual humanism as a binder and also a foundation for education. And how we are making all the mistakes that the Greeks tell you about. <laughs> They're warning you about it. But it was deliberately done because the Aristotelians were corrupt, right? It was, it, they weren't looking at the theory, they were looking at the people, and they were corrupt. Right. And um, they used Aristotle to justify their power and privilege. They used it for colonization. They used it to justify their superiority. I mean, it was completely, it was the poison that justified their oppression. But you can take the definitions and just use them and say that that was that's a corruption of the of the um, tradition. Thank you, okay. Martha. Yeah, you have given us lots of food for thought, and I have some questions for you later. <laughs> How do I get back stop to you guys? Stop sharing screen on top, middle top. Stop sharing screen. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank there you. Go. You have given us lots of food for thought. And uh, before we proceed with the Q&A session uh, for the last half an hour of our session, our webinar, we, let's have James, 20 to 30 minutes for you, James. The floor or the screen is yours. Bear with me. Can you see my slides? Uh, soon. There. Yeah. Okay. Now we can see it. Yep. yep. Uh, and you can hear me, obviously. Yes. yes. It's a little bit quiet. Is there yeah. any way to turn yeah. that up? Let me put the microphone next to my mouth more. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Just make sure to speak up. That's all. Okay. All right. I'll. I'll. Uh, I've got my glass of water. So if you see me picking that up, you know I've been shouting too loudly, and uh, <laughs> I'll try not to shout. Um, uh, firstly, uh, assalamu alaikum to all of. Uh, uh, our Islamic colleagues James, and uh, friends. You might want to get listen. closer to the mic. Oh, mea culpa. Um, yeah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum to uh, all, our, all our Islamic uh, listeners. Wa uh, alaikum salam. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, uh, for me, it's 11.33 at night. I don't know. Um, I know in Indonesia, it's two hours behind. And I think in the States, it must be in the morning. So um, thanks a lot for all of you for, um, for putting the time in to, to listen. Um, I'm going to talk generally uh, about, I guess, higher education, but also give a bit of a focus on what I see as some of the challenges and problems of it and then finish off or round off by discussing very briefly this this concept of the humaniversity which uh, uh, which actually by the way is not my idea um, and I'll, I'll discuss that at the end so perhaps rather than waste time with introductions I'll, I'll get straight to it um, I, I do take on board the um, the the problem of jargon and um, <laughs> I'm, I must admit, guilty as charged. So uh, if there is a little bit of jargon being thrown around, don't worry about it. Um, uh, I'm sure I can answer questions about that, about that later if, if, if you think that it's, it's worthwhile. Okay, um, I titled the presentation Humanizing Universities um, because I think that's in one way captures the kind of, and it captures some of the themes that uh, Martha was talking about as well, the, the, the challenges that we face, not just humanizing universities, humanizing education, humanizing our society. Um, and so that's why I've titled that. And I guess the first, the first slide that I, here we go, yep, it's working. Um, the first slide that I had was, was a pretty simple one where I just said, one of the biggest problems we have whenever we talk about this is something that occurs even before we talk. And that is the problem of whether we get taken seriously in the first place, um, whether people think this is a problem worth discussing in the first place. And we have to face the fact 
um, that, that many people don't necessarily take seriously um, or think that what we're talking about in terms of humanizing universities, irrespective of the angles and the, the philosophies and the religious traditions and so forth that we come from in terms of discussing it, a lot of people um, find this simply uh, uh, play with words. And we have to face that because we're in a serious, I think we're in a serious crisis uh, uh, globally, if you will. Um, so we have to face the fact that many people think that when we talk about humanizing, when we talk about the common good, when we talk about um, uh, re-energizing the ethical nature <laughs> of our institutions, uh, many people see, see this as a, as a meaningless jargon to what they call a pseudo problem. Those of you who've uh, studied um, certain branches of, of linguistic philosophy and so forth will, will, will see, will see, the, uh, see the, the argument there. So concepts such as humanization and ideas such as a humanversity, for example, or, um, you know, as I said before, even concepts of the common good. Um, the, one of the first things, and I start here because I'm going to end here. One of the big challenges we have is A, for people to take us seriously, but B, another one is, is the challenge that much of, of this kind of language can get used by the contemporary uh, corporate world, the contemporary uh, institutions of power, and simply um, uh, put on, on, on our um, university documents or on our advertising, on our, on our marketing, can be used simply as a way of rebranding. We, we have, um, you would have seen things like humanized banking and uh, humanize this and humanize that. Um, so I think as a, as a, as a get go, I'm, I'm starting off being critical of myself in a way or critical of, of, the, of my position because I realize that um, if it was that easy for us to prevail in this debate, we wouldn't be here talking about it. Um, so I'll begin there that uh, the problem with humanizing universities and the problems of universities begins with actually being taken seriously and with people taking it seriously. Now, in regards to that, a little bit of self-promotion, which I know is, uh, as it was pointed out before, the sin of pride. Um, <laughs> but um, I've written a few books trying to engage with this issue uh, in different ways. And these are the books on the I guess the key text is, is on the notion of the humaniversity, which I'll get to. But before I get to that, I want to go back a step. And this is where I'm going to get into a little bit of jargon, but I hope, I'm, I'm hoping that I can, can avoid some of the more uh, deleterious um, examples of jargon. Um, I want to look at three things in, in part one of my presentation. Uh, the first thing, and I'm going to have to move these pictures of people. The first thing um, I want to look at is the problems of what we call deinstitutionalization, subjectification and detraditionalization of modernity. And I want to argue, and I'll argue this later, that these things, this deinstitutionalization and detraditionalization are, are big problems when we talk about education and big problems when we're talking about addressing the drift, the cultural moral, uh, political drift that occurs in society. Secondly, um, there is the problem of how to reinstitutionalize uh, moral uh, habits, uh, mores, and so forth within, within our institution. Um, so we have the problem of the deinstitutionalization of, of, of moral norms. We have the, the potential solution, yet difficult, of reinstitutionalizing this, and how do we do this? And I'm going to discuss this through the prism using the, the phrase or using the idea of universities as mediating institutions. And thirdly, I'm going to engage what I, and I've kind of copied from a, uh, another uh, uh, philosopher here. Um, I'm going to look at what we call the theologico-political origins of our higher educational institutions as one way, not the only way, but as one way of thinking through how to reground, how to uh, give uh, uh, grounding back to our institutions, to our uh, to our universities, in the service of humanizing, in the service of um, re-establishing that kind of uh, moral grounding that uh, 
uh, moral centering uh, within our institutions. So let me let me begin. Now, I talked about deinstitutionalization, um, and and what I what I mean by by deinstitutionalization is the the breakdown of common everyday expected habits and mores in in um, in Malaysia and uh, Indonesia, you'll often hear people discuss the breakdown of adab and adat, that these are breaking down and, um, and that people are no longer following them and so forth. This, when we hear discussions like that, this is an example of deinstitutionalization, right? The breakdown of manners, the breakdown of common mores, the breakdown of traditional, traditional structures. So we have this increasing deinstitutionalization of life, the breakdown of, of, of um, those things that used to, used to, um, uh, used to bind us, uh, cultural mores, traditions, and so forth. And we have an increase in a sort of abstract society, what we call, what the theorists call abstract society. So um, less and less bonding to things like, so an example would be, uh, societies where families are breaking down, uh, where people no longer we talk about we talk about the village, but in fact the village itself is breaking down, and we have an increased sense of abstraction, uh, deinstitutionalization, detraditionalization, and we 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 start to live in a society, and this is a global phenomenon, although it's not equally it's not equal in all in all cultures there are different uh, aspects to this but there's also a global phenomenon where you get this process of subjectification what that means is whereas before we would inherit our moral norms we would inherit our sense of right and wrong we simply did it out of habit and 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 inheritance through our families through um, there was a normative integration in society now increasingly almost everything is becoming an object of choice Right? You can choose to do this or you can choose to do that. You can choose to have uh, this kind of family or you can choose to have this kind of family or you can choose to have no family at all. This kind of thing is, 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 is part of the processes of modernity and it, it creates this kind of sense of what uh, Peter Berger, and for those of you who have kind of... Um, read the sort of social theory that I read, you can hear Peter Berger <laughs> in the background of, of what I'm talking about. You get this sense of homelessness and this sense of homelessness, of abstraction, of deinstitutionalization and so forth are the characteristics, are the markers of, of what we now call, for want of a better term, modernity, uh, the contemporary world. Um, now I better hurry up because I've only got half an hour. Um, Basically, basically, therefore, one of the big the big issues is how do we how do we advance the problem of normative integration within an increasingly pluralized societies and an increasingly plural world? In other words, a world of diversity, right? How do we address the problem of the disintegration of and detraditionalization, de disintegration of moral norms, and so forth? in a world that is increasingly plural and so forth. And to cut a long story short, the argument that I'd like to put forward is that we have to look at, in terms of higher education, we have to look at universities as mediating institutions, right? So they mediate between the state and, and, and the family, between, between businesses. So for they, they also should say, well, of course, Jim, that's what you universities to the society. But when those institutions become overdetermined, overwhelmed by all of the forces and pressures and contradictions and so forth of a society, their capacity as mediating institutions to reinforce moral norms, to to Produce, give some kind of binding identities, and here I don't mean it in, in any fundamentalist sense, I mean it just in a, in a broad way. Their capacity to do this is increasingly challenged. Right? Um, again, for those of you who are 
um, uh, thinking through the philosophy and the social theory behind what I've said there, um, possibly give a bit of a tick to Alastair McIntyre, because <laughs> that, that notion of practices um, influences me a little bit, or perhaps more than a little, um, in, in my theorization there. My, my third point that I said about was the, what I called, you know, the religious pedagogical or spiritual pedagogical. I, I use theologico, but it, that's not necessarily um, important if that becomes problematic to people. Essentially, what I'm arguing is that spiritual faith provides a potential source and a strong direction for ethical thematization. In other words, for providing an ethical theme, a kind of moral uh, center, if you will, in education. Um, and that and that the spiritual traditions can provide this kind of stabilizing, um, how would you say, uh, stabilizing function in a society that is otherwise increasingly fragmented, and increasingly at conflict, and increasingly increasingly ill at ease. So you can see, um, again, to kind of put the intellectual footnotes on what I'm saying, you can see a, a combination of uh, uh, a critique of homelessness with Peter Berger. You can hear a certain Durkheimian, Emil uh, Durkheim uh, coming through in terms of the notions of normative integration. And um, underneath that as well, there's a, a, a bit of a nod, uh, a bit of a nod to Alastair McIntyre. Um, okay, part two, I know I'm racing. What are the problems that we face? Okay, what are th these are some of the issues that we've discussed, but what are some of the really uh, driving forces that are breaking down education and not allowing us to realize this kind of moral grounding, if you will, uh, this not allowing us to realize a kind of provide a kind of vital center to education. Well, I, I'm going to uh, comment firstly on the marketization of higher education, which I think came up in, in, in Martha's talk uh, uh, in terms of neoliberalism and so forth. I'm going to talk about the enfeeblement and corruption of our institutions um, and this idea that we are unencumbered selves. Uh, that's a nod to Michael Sandel. <laughs> um, for all of you who, uh, again, uh, enjoy, enjoy, like me, reading social theory. Um, I'm also going to uh, mention, touch on the problem of what, what is called in the social theory isomorphic mimicry. And in other words, the fact that institutions tend to mimic what we think of as the best practice or the practice that has the highest status. And of course, neoliberal globalization has the highest status in modernity. And so people tend to mimic, tend to want to replicate uh, that in, in everything they do. So, um, and finally, in part two, I'm going to talk about the need to reinstitutionalization, gr ground ethics back in into our institutions um, and, and at the end of this I'm going to suggest one concept uh, uh, that I think is particularly useful for doing that. So let's begin. Crowding out. Um, essentially what happens in, in, in our institutions, our higher education institutions, the uh, reduction of it crowds out everything else okay remember at the beginning of my talk I said it's hard for us to be taken seriously well one of the reasons is because um, uh, as we could term it now neoliberal rationality literally crowds out other ways of other ways of doing things other ways of thinking so we have this increasing commercialization which then crowds out um, uh, for example, other, other motives for being teachers. Let me give you uh, one, one example off the top of my head. Um, when, you, when you, for example, introduce things like performance pay, right? It, 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 these issues really cut to, they get down to brass tacks, right? When you introduce things like performance pay into universities, so for example, if I pass, you know, if 90% if of my students get A's, uh, I will get a higher, a higher wage than, uh, you know, than uh, my colleague down the, in, in the next room. When you introduce these things, what they do or what they can do is crowd out the non-pecuniary, the non-calculative, the non-financial 
motivations that may have been, and I would argue are, for most teachers and most uh, academics, the, the, the kind of key motivators that motivate them in their work. So a sense of caring for people, a love of the subject matter, an interest in knowledge and so forth. So what we have is a crowding out of, our, of, of what, broadly speaking, we can say were our more traditional moral and ethical selves by this logic of, of neoliberal um, rationality, which then um, generates uh, a neoliberal personality uh, amongst all of the people working in universities. And I've used, I've used the, the issue of performance pay. Another one would be your KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, producing a competitive, competitive relationship between, between uh, staff. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a chasing for numbers um, rather than a collaborative uh, exercise. Now, before I move on on this, don't, don't think that I'm saying that it's all bad on one side and all good on the other. Um, clearly, there are positives in, 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 in many aspects. For example, um, being able to look at whether people are doing well in their job has some positive things. I'm talking here about when these when these logics and these rationalities become dominant and totally colonize the institutions, then you find that you have this crowding out and you have a destruction of our capacity to think and to act and to understand our institutional lives in anything other than neoliberal terms. Okay. We have the enfeeblement and corruption. Now by corruption, I don't really, I'm not talking about it in the liberal sense of, you know, somebody robbing a bank or you know, being paid a kickback or something like that. I'm talking about it probably in a classical humanist sense, the corrupting of our institutions, the, the, the destruction of their higher, uh, higher aims um, and the replacement of them by, yeah, this, uh, this, this, this grab for money, this grab for status, this grab for points and so forth. And this enfeebles our institutions. It completely destroys them from the inside out. Completely destroys them. Um, copying. Um, I mentioned, I drew, a, we are mimetic being. What, what does that mean? We copy. <laughs> we, uh, and, 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 and I know for, for philosophical purists, they'll say, well, mimesis isn't exactly copying, Jim. Um, yes, but for the sake of argument here. Um, we are, we, we tend to uh, try to copy, to mimic um, others. That's how we learn, um, in part. And this, this, uh, this also can be a, can uh, lead us to copy good good things, but it also can lead us to copy the powerful or or the corrupt. And so, we simply uh, copy what we think of as best practice or perhaps most powerful practice. Um, the, the practice that has the power uh, in, in this world. And in this world, the practice that has the power is, of course, um, the dominant neoliberal imaginary. Um, and so you'll see this all the time. You see, you see that universities, and this is, this is a, a very, I, I know it's a very simple point, but institutions and universities, as, as a good example, um, are they 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 their bread and butter in some ways is, is realized through this isomorphic uh, process. They copy, uh, they mimic, uh, they seek to, to belong to what they think of as best practice. Now there's nothing necessarily wrong with that per se, but as I said before, when the best practice happens to be uh, forms of, uh, entails forms of uh, um, cognitive colonialism, uh, forms of neo-imperialism, uh, neo uh, forms of fetishization and commodification of education, then th this, 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 this process of um, isomorphic uh, uh, copying can be deeply, deeply problematic. Okay, I have to hurry. Um, Reinstitutionalization and grounding higher education, resisting the spectacle society. Um, <coughs> sorry, Mayor Culpa. Um, Essentially, to cut a long story short, um, we, we seem to be turning our, our backs on each other and uh, turning our gaze to the spectacles of higher education. What's an example of a spectacle? 
Um, rankings tables <laughs> are an example of a spectacle, right? Um, and and what what we find is that our older, more traditional, uh, moral, normative uh, philosophies, practices, histories are increasingly increasingly uh, jilted to one side, and our gaze is drawn to the spectacle of competition, of commodification, uh, and of success in in a world where not everyone can be a success. Um, and quite frankly, in a world that is rigged, um, there you go, <laughs> a world that is rigged, rigged against against uh, people actually realising success uh, in in the higher educational system. So we have we need to reinstitutionalise and ground higher education and resist this spectacle society. So where does this leave us? I talked about, and I said I was going to mention the notion of the humaniversity. The, the idea, of course, is not mine. Um, I was introduced to this concept when I worked with um, Tantri Zulkifli Abdul Razak, who at the time was the Vice Chancellor of University Science Malaysia, USM. And he coined, uh, or at least as far as I know, uh, he coined the term of humaniversity. Um, and it was a term that he was using uh, in seeking to uh, reform, direct, the direction of, of, of USM. And he basically, one of, his, uh, one of his core ideas was this notion of moving, uh, uh, you know, seeking, seeking education to be for a humanized society, okay? And so there was, it, 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 it was a, a concept that draws both on uh, religious or spiritual uh, uh, grounding, uh, and it also draws upon more, uh, in some senses even, or at least it has synergies, perhaps is a better way of putting it, synergies with um, other, uh, even secular um, forms of commitment to social justice and so forth and so on. Um, now, what I want to argue here very quickly, in, in looking in, in, in the kind of meta thing behind this concept, um, when we the the sort of arguments I've been talking about institutionalization and deinstitutionalization and so forth, the um, uh, sort of rationality, the the the, the rationalization of, of neoliberal uh, modernity. Um, I, I mentioned before this idea of universities as mediating structures. It seems to me that if university is simply mimic and copy and are complete or the interests of the latest fashions and fads, then there is absolutely no way, in my view, that we can resist, right? <laughs> that we can actually um, resist the tidal wave of neoliberal, um, neoliberal ideology functioning through our thing. So we have to understand the way in which if we're to have a discussion about values, irrespective of the traditions of which we want to ground them, the way in which this, this works in society. And I've, I've, I've drawn this table up, which is essentially um, uh, uh, drawn from sociology. Um, you can see that I've put meta order. Um, it, that's the overarching, the canopy, if you will core rules, beliefs, statements, fundamental right and wrong, the sorts of things that people uh, generally feel in a society. Then you've got the mediating order, that's at the institution or organisations, institutional conventions, expectations and culture. And then what I call the local order, the day-to-day -day habits and manners, just day-to-day. -day. These are the day-to-day -day widely held uh, mores, manners, folkways, if you will, um, to use another, another theorisation, that people use in their day to day. Now, in a society where you have normative integration, a kind of, uh, and I don't mean this in a totalizing sense, I, I, I have to uh, be careful that there is a strong, strong conservative aspect to my thinking. And whilst there's, there's a strength to it, there's a weakness to it. Um, but in, in societies with normative integration, um, there is a kind of coherence, if you will, or at least a, uh, a synergy, um, not not a, not an identity, not a not a not a prison like uh, uh, you know um, absolute lockstep <laughs> kind of relationship, but a an integration between the binding canopy of moral precepts and so forth, 
the international, so university, norms, codes, and practices, and the day-to-day -day practices, okay, that you have. With a society where there's a disintegration, and even with an institution where there's a disintegration, the morals are reduced to slogans, okay? So you have a lot of slogans humanizing the universe or humanizing banking and so forth. Reduction to slogans. You have a lack of coherence between the moral precepts and the culture in an organization, what we call organizational hypocrisy, theory practice failure, okay? So imagine an organization that, for example, had simply slogans, right, at the top of it. Imagine then that in the day-to-day -day practices of the organization, um, the uh, regulations and so forth, imagine that they were completely at odds with those moral slogans. Now, many of you uh, have no difficulty imagining that because for some of us, we feel that that's the way, <laughs> that's the way often, sometimes our institutions actually function. Um, and then imagine at the bottom here, uh, collapse of basic understanding in manners. If all those three things are occurring, morals reduced to slogans, so um, lack of coherence between moral precepts and organizational culture, and then fundamentally at the individual level, simple breakdown of basic manners, simple breakdown of basic, uh, basic ways of being together, you have what we call disintegration, okay? All right. Bear with me. I think in this book, which I think I've got, <laughs> got it here, um, I said that I was going to uh, briefly mention and draw upon a concept uh, that I think is useful in us, us addressing the problems that I've talked about. And that concept is the concept of Adab, okay? Um, now, I first came across that concept um, when I was uh, actually when I was um, at USM, uh, and I, I, I first the first time that I came across the concept, interestingly enough, for those of you who are interested in in the history of the ideas, was when I was reading um, Said Naqib Alatas's book, um, uh, uh, his writings. And there, the concept of Adab was something that he used quite strongly. And it, and it, it, it pricked my interest. It, 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 it pricked my interest because I was looking for something that, that could provide some kind of binding normative code uh, to an institutions which I, which I felt were um, often suffering this, this process as a fragmentation. I know I, I'm paint, painting it a little bit too bleakly, I know, but I'm doing that to make make my point to, to bring things out here. Um, the concept of Adab, broadly speaking, refers to the inculcation of good behavior, proper self and other regard, decent, decency uh, and humaneness um, in our interrelationships with each other. Um, my view is that teaching and, and the, uh, not just teaching, um, all of the practices of a university, that this concept of Adab, which is, um, uh, reminds us of the spiritual dimension to being uh, well-mannered and cultured, um, which has a close correlation with the ancient, the Greek term paideia, right? Has a close <laughs> correlation with this. Um, uh, that this concept is is something that was very important. Uh, a writer called George Macdisi, uh, who wrote on the rise of the colleges, talked about in medieval uh, Andalusia and Al Andalus. Uh, not, not just in Al-Andalus, but to take as an example, um, talked about uh, Adab institutions. And these Adab institutions, um, institutions that would cultivate this, were, were often, uh, or could be, were educational institutions. So this concept of Adab as a, a concept that both has a, uh, a vertical um, a dimension, uh, a religious dimension, which gets to my theologico <laughs> pedagogical uh, phraseology right has a vertical dimension um, which I think most of my listeners will, will will be more than aware of and but also has a horizontal dimension in terms of in terms of relationships between people 
a vertical dimension in terms of relationships of one to the almighty, a horizontal dimension in terms of relationships between each other. Um, and this, this concept of Adab struck me as very important. Uh, James, you have one or two minutes to conclude. Okay, all right, I better, I better, I better hurry up then. Um, essentially, to cut a long story short, um, the, the theorization in the book on the humaniversity is an effort to reintroduce, not just um, to, not, not, not necessarily an effort to reintroduce it to people who already know of it and are already uh, pushing for its introduction into education, but to reintroduce it to a secular audience as well. Um, because I think that it is a concept, uh, a great gift, if you will, from Islamic civilization um, to the world. And it is a great both regulative and constitutive principle that could be used as a way of looking at how to um, re-articulate and uh, articulate uh, educational practices. Now, I won't, I'll have to hurry up. Um, basically, all I really try to, to argue is that the moral aims of institutions are an intrinsic and substantive uh, part of their practical functioning, not merely an afterthought. Um, they, uh, organizations are habit forming and habitualizing institutions and, and understanding the way that we integrate, uh, that we in, uh, uh, connect to each other is a key to understanding the nature of educational reform. Um, universities as formative institutions can provide us with a belonging to cultural narratives and obligations without which we can founder, thus my uh, theorization with Adab. The relative autonomy of the universities from the state and the market is thus not a luxury for higher education, but a, necessary, a part of their necessary character and which can allow them to inculcate these necessary, and I use this Tocquevillian phrase, but it's also that um, it, it resonates with Islamic ethics and certainly with the, with the works of Imam al-Ghazali, uh, uh, that can inculcate the necessary habits of the heart for ethical development. Um, since I've only had a minute and I think I've used it up, one of the key sources of moral behavior which lies at the root of our civilization, certainly within the Abrahamic faiths, uh, lies in the spiritual and religious traditions. And the argument in this book, the part of the argument in this book, is that Adab as a, um, a, a both a spiritual and normative concept uh, and, a and, a, and a form of practical rationality, a form of actual doing things, um, may very well be one of the keys to understanding how institutions can still uh, uh, maintain their moral center, uh, reground their practices back to uh, the tradi their traditions of, of, uh, of morals and ethics, and, and also uh, uh, is a concept that gives a good salute uh, to the, to the uh, nobility and importance of religious faith and the religious traditions in the Abrahamic traditions, and in this particular case, the Islamic uh, traditions. And finally, that this argument is not just something that uh, interested me because I was studying in Malaysia. It was something that interested me because I thought it was something that we could bring back to the world. And as I say before, I think that the concept of Adab uh, as, a, as a moral, uh, regulative and constitutive principle is a gift from Islamic civilization uh, to the world. And I, my, my basic argument in, in this book is that it's a gift to education. Terima uh, kasih. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, much James. Thank you very much. <laughs> if we are in a room, we will clap now. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions here by the audience. And I would just like, uh, before, I proceed with the questions, translating the questions. Uh, I would say that this uh, webinar will be uploaded later to a YouTube channel. In the chat room, I have given you the long and short link to the channel, yeah? bitly.com uh, slash uh, Surya channel. Uh, there's also a long link there. And you can uh, see the video later with subtitles in both Indonesian and English, as well as the slides, yeah? and the notes from Martha, me, and uh, Dr. Campbell. 
I have recorded some questions here and there are more questions coming, but I'm going to read these questions. I think I'm going to ask all of them before uh, Martha and James can answer. Uh, so from uh, Pak Shahranuddin uh, of UNPAB, Universitas Panchabudi, a university here in Medan. This is uh, related, I think. Uh, what do you think? What, the, what do the speakers think about the conversion of Hagia Sophia from a neutral, secular, uh, quote-unquote, place to a mosque? Yeah, so that's the first question. I think it's related to our topic, yeah? So that's the question. Second, from Pak Ikhwan, uh, he's asking you, what do you think of the non-linearity of uh, education paths? For example, in Indonesia, we have uh, more or less three education paths, the uh, general or secular path, the education path, uh, the education, general education path, and the Islamic path. So we have three kinds of universities here in Indonesia. We have Islamic universities, religious universities, uh, not only Islamic, but Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, and Confucian universities. So that's one part. Uh, uh, and second, we have uh, education universities, so State University of Education. In Medan, we have UNIMED. In Jakarta, we have UNJ. In Jogja, we have UNY. So that's the second path. These two paths, and in the third path is the uh, secular or general or, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, uh, common university, which is the uh, Universitas Indonesia, uh, Universitas Sumatera Utara. So they sort of, uh, quote unquote, uh, secular uh, universities. So Pak Iwan said that he wants, for him, he said it's better uh, for the path to be linear. So those educated in the Islamic stream, in the primary and secondary, they are the ones who should be allowed into the religious stream, which is the state Islamic universities or state other religious universities, state or not. Uh, so he said that way the quality can be maintained. So what do you think of the idea of linearity? Yeah? And we have from... Uh, one moment, yeah. I noted the, the the first two questions, but the the rest came uh, at the end of James' presentation. Uh, so Pak Saporin Siregar of Winsu, yeah, uh, my campus, he asked, uh, in this time of pandemic, how do you see, especially to Prof Campbell, yeah, Doctor Campbell, how do you see about uh, how do you see the development of uh, education? Uh, quality in the world. Uh, uh, do you see that this uh, inequality, the existing inequality, is exacerbated because of the pandemic? Because not all people have uh, online facilities, yeah, phones, computers, internet connection. So, what do you think of that? And last but not least, from Fazlur Rahmat, yeah, uh, what do you think? What is the Western uh, opinion? on uh, pesantren in Indonesia, on the Islamic primary and secondary uh, religious education institution, pesantren. I think both of you know pesantren, yeah? Uh, do they weaken or strengthen civilization? Do they contribute to the weakening or, or strengthening of the civilization? So we have four questions. Never mind if you can't remember them all. You can answer uh, perhaps Martha first, and I will remind you of the questions later. So Martha, to you. Well, I, I just have to go back, back to, in order to be an Asian citizen, you have to know the bridge between Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Protestantism, and Catholicism, and whatever else, you know. If these people are given equal rights in the state, then you do need to know that there's a common set of virtues that all those religions do try to teach. So I don't really care, you know, if it, you know, you could get the Islamic view, but it get it in a very narrow way so that you end up feeling superior to other Indonesians just because of your religion. You don't want to do that, right? Uh, so it really depends on how you get it. 
Now, it is this problem with the secular, if it doesn't teach the virtues, then you have a problem, right? Because children need to learn virtue. And so I really don't think you can make any sort of absolutist claim. It's a judgment call. It depends upon what's actually going on, right? What's going on in the classroom? What is the character of the teachers? Um, so I did give a talk at one of those Pisandrans. It was great. It was fun. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I just talk and then I don't know the context. Um, but I guess I feel like the thing that I gave Indonesians was just another possible set of tools, right? Because the, I could see on the Jakarta Post that they have other intellectual educational leaders that think of holistic education. You know, I'm not the only one, um, but I have that to offer. And then Indonesians can just think about that and they can figure out what they want to do with it. You know, it's not my business to decide. Does that seem fair? Thank you, Martha. How about the... Uh... So Hagia Sophia, do you have a specific answer? Well, depends upon the context, you know? I mean, I know that intellectuals are getting silenced, repressed, jailed. <laughs> now, you know, it's religion can be weaponized. That's all. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say I know this or that. I'm going to say here's what happened in the U.S. after 9-11, very deliberately, the Republican operatives weaponized Christianity. They made it into an empire-building religion, and they did it step by step. They're very thoughtful about it. And so now, with the Black Lives Matter, that was the religion I was raised on. My father marched with Martin Luther King in Selma, and... That was the union of reason and faith. When I was eight years old, the ecumenical movement, the Catholic Church opened up. We had interfaith dialogues. So if you have an interfaith tradition, if you have a union of reason and faith tradition, if you have a Socratic critical thinking, examining yourself tradition, fine, you know? But be very careful about weaponizing religion because that's where neoliberalism is going. And the U.S., you know, they're a cautionary tale <laughs> about how you can lose a democracy. And that's 50 years ago. I read about how Athens lost their democracy. And uh, my country just keeps going farther in that direction. It's, it's scary. So I would say, be careful, make judgments about that. Can't hear you. I forgot to say that the question about inequality, which was directed to James, was, meant, uh, was asked by Abrar, yeah, not Fazlur. Fazlur asked this question, do you think the material condition like the existing uh, prosperity of a particular community uh, or society uh, determines the character of the educational institution. Perhaps this is the last question for you, Martha, before we move on to James. Well, I know um, that neoliberals use religion to cover up their greed, right? And so when money is driving a system, what? When money drives a system, education is the way our country's laws have changed. It's very, very difficult to pull yourself up. If you live in a certain zip code, you're very unlikely to go to college because the tax base changed. The taxes paid for schools are local real estate taxes. So. People live in expensive houses, they pay a lot of taxes, and they take their kids to a public school, forget it. And then in the ghetto, where the houses aren't worth much, 
there's no tax base for education. It is really bad. <laughs> um, I don't know if you saw those demonstrations in Minneapolis. My, my daughters went to high school one block from those demonstrations, so I know. <laughs> okay. Is that enough? Is that people understand that? Thank you so much. Sorry, thank you, Martha. Uh, kepada, I will speak in Indonesian for a bit now. Kepada semua peserta, mungkin kita tidak punya waktu untuk menerjemahkan jawaban para pembicara uh, sekarang. Tapi nanti di video itu akan saya terjemahkan dalam keterangan YouTube ya. Uh, pertanyaan dan jawaban Anda ini semua direkam. Uh, nanti akan saya uh, terjemahkan di situ. Sekarang coba coba akan saya terjemahkan singkat. Ya, uh, Martha pada dasarnya mengatakan itu terserah kepada negara dan komunitas masing-masing. Tidak perlu dibat dibatasi. Jadi dia uh, menyerahkan pilihan kepada negara dan komunitas masing-masing tentang linearitas tentang perubahan dari uh, uh, Hagia Sophia dari uh, tempat netral menjadi atau sekular menjadi masjid dan dia hanya berpesan hati-hati dengan uh, uh, demokrasi hati-hati dengan kebijakan karena Amerika Serikat bukanlah contoh yang baik dalam segala hal neoliberalisme yang berkuasa di Amerika Serikat dan negara-negara barat lain itu bukan contoh yang baik bahkan sangat buruk ya dan Indonesia harus berhati-hati kalau ingin mencontoh mereka Uh, okay, now I will switch to English. So James, perhaps I will remind you of the question, yeah? From Pak Syahranuddin of UNPAP. Uh, I will remind you the question from Pak Syahranuddin of UNPAP about Hagia Sophia from Ikhwan of uh, Research and Development uh, from North Maluku, yeah? Maluku Utara, about non-linearity, like from Pesantren to Secular University, from, uh, from Abrar, yeah? Uh, inequality. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. From Pak Sapar, Safarudin Siregar uh, of Winsu about inequality. Uh, what do you think of inequality, existing inequality uh, for education now? For Abrar is, do you think pesantren contributes to the strengthening or weakening of civilization? Last but not least, from Pazlur, uh, material condition. Uh, what do you think of the material condition of Uh, the society or the community in which the education takes place. Does it uh, form the character or not? Uh, it's very noisy here. I'm going to mute my speaker. Okay. Hold on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes? I can, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> Surya, I might get you after I answer each question to just repeat the next question because I, 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 my, my memory on these things is not too good. But if the first question was about the uh, Turkish, uh, the, the, the uh, mosque issue, um, I'm not an expert on that. I, I tend to refrain from discussing things that I know very little about. Um, I think I do agree with the, with the, with the critique of weaponizing religion though, uh, in any, and that's, that's something that seems to occur all over the place. I, whilst I have a, a real sympathy for the, um, the religious roots of, of, of the ethical debates and, and so forth that we've been talking about, and I hope that came through in my um, talk, it's not without um, certain cautionary <laughs> um, a cautionary understanding that religion can also be used um, uh, for bad as well. I've got a book here, a famous American thinker, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, where's the camera? <laughs> um, and I was reading specifically on this, <laughs> on this kind of issue uh, where he talks about some of the damage that can be done um, by people that are religiously motivated. All I'll say is, so I won't talk specifically about the The mosque issue, I, I simply don't know enough about it. I, but I do think that um, if you'll notice what I, when I was talking about Adab, my position is the diametric opposite to what we would call a Schmittian friend enemy distinction understanding of religion and politics. Uh, those of you who know Carl Schmitt, uh, the famous uh, jurisprudence uh, philosopher in Nazi Germany, 
came up with the coined the phrase political theology. And he said that the characteristic that all political concepts are forms of secularized religion, right? And furthermore, he said that the core, the core, uh, the core uh, characteristic of politics is the friend enemy distinction. My discussion of Adab is the diametric opposite <laughs> of that, of that conceptualization. And insofar as any of these issues uh, get themselves framed as ways to inflame the friend enemy distinction and drive a politics of conflict and um, uh, zero sum uh, war of all against all in the Hobbesian sense, then I have a problem with it. But I don't, I don't pass a specific comment on that particular issue because I'm simply, to be honest, I, I have a tendency to not talk about things I don't know about. But in the more broader sense of, of religious and political conflict, the reason that I uh, have emphasized that concept of Adab is simply because it is a concept that is completely the opposite. It's a binding concept that people of different faiths or no faith, <laughs> right, um, can can uh, combine them in in a in a in a in a moral universe in a moral ecology uh, that I that I believe to 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 be to be positive. It is in a sense a um, what's the word? Not corollary isn't the word. Um, similar uh, concept to paideia, um, uh, and the concept of paideia is completely different to the concept of friend enemy. <laughs> right? It is uh, totally different. Uh, not just different, frankly, opposite. So I know I haven't answered the question, but perhaps I've given a little bit of food for thought around around questions like that. I think that when when people use religion to advance profane aims, uh, they 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 commit what uh, again Reinhold Niebuhr and I just pick him off the top of my book pile um, talks about the profanation of religion. The profanation of politics, and um, I think that that Schmittian view, that friend-enemy distinction view, uh, whether it's applied in politics, in religion, or in any aspect of our of our of our lives, is is negative. But in the specific issue of that uh, of the Hagia Sophia mosque uh, issue, I, I I make no comment. Um, I, I I speak not whereof that I do not know. What's the second question? Surya? Hello, Surya. The second question is about the nonlinearity. So what about... What does, non yeah. what does that mean? What do you mean by that? Well, Indonesia has a lot of uh, streams of education. So you have the Islamic yep. stream uh, and yep, you have the yep. general stream. Umum, yeah? Umum dan Islam. So yep. people are free to go from one stream to the other, or even to mix the streams, to take both streams. Pak Ikhwan is of yep. the opinion that you should go to through only one stream. So for example, if you want to go to an Islamic university, you should be educated at a pesantren or at a madrasa. So what do you think yep. of this uh, idea of linearity in your primary, secondary, and tertiary education? Um, I'm, I'm not... Um... I'm not, uh, I, I would have to study that very closely before. I, I find people, I, I don't know what you all think, but I find we often are tempted to talk on things we know very little about. I, I don't take that temptation. <laughs> um, I would say that at, 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 on the surface, I have no problem uh, with the plural education system that you have there. Um, and if people want to chop and change between it, uh, it's it's it would be simply a a problem of the recognition of the qualifications you know the the standards uh, between each of those segments. So for example, if one went to a, a primary school that was a Islamic primary school and then went to a secondary school that was a state school, for example, um, uh, the problem seems to me to be a, a problem of of whether the you know the the standards are recognised between sectors. But um, I don't have a strong view about that. Um, I, I'm not really a rationalizer. I, I do like the diversity. Um, this gets, you reminded me of the question about Pazantran, uh, what I thought of Pazantran. Yeah, um, I, I've been, I've visited, uh, I think three, three Pazantrans. 
um, in my time in Sumatra, as a matter of fact. And I think that, again, it, it, I think you can't just judge everything. You know, <laughs> it's, there's, there's so much diversity within that sector the, the, the diversity within that sector is 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 just as diverse as the diversity within the state sector. Yeah, there's a, a wide range. I went from from schools that had very few resources, uh, very poor students, um, you know, to schools that were quite well resourced and quite internationally connected and so forth. Um, so I don't think that uh, you can necessarily judge it just from from you know, the, 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 the label Pazantran. Generally speaking though, to, to say something perhaps more uh, pointed about, about that sector. I, I can remember when I asked, um, I think it was the, uh, the school, well, I call the school principal. Um, and they, they were schools that educated poor kids. Some of the schools I went to educated poor kids. Kids that couldn't even get into the state sector, or at least it was difficult because maybe they were orphans or, you know, their parents didn't have any money or they were thrown out of home or, you, you know, all this sort of thing. And what I found was that, was that um, when I talked about that with the people at the school, my sense was that in those schools I went to, they were doing a, a very important social, social good. Um, now, I'm not saying in all schools and all places, I'm not saying that because I simply don't know. But certainly the schools that I visited what I saw were dedicated teachers, and in the case of the schools with very uh, limited uh, resources, I saw institutions that were doing their best to educate uh, people who otherwise might not get an education at all. Um, so I, I, that, that would be only my, my pointed observation, and that's an observation simply of what I've seen. It's not a broader political statement or a, a, a social sociological observation or anything like that. but. I do think that they play an important an important role uh, in, so in, in, in the education of uh, many kids who otherwise might not get an education at all and might just be on the streets. Does that make sense, Surya? Yes, thank you very much. I guess this uh, goes into the last two questions about the inequality yep. and material condition of educational institutions, higher educational institutions yep. especially. Do you think uh, it formed the character of the institution. I think uh, perhaps Martha also later after James can conclude or can give her final words for this webinar yeah? because uh, uh, we are uh, out of time actually but never mind let's extend this to another five minutes. So James uh, what do you think about inequality of this uh, uh, existing inequality uh, the effect of this inequality uh, in this current pandemic uh, because lots of areas, regions, students, uh, as you said, some of them are very poor and they don't have access to the internet. And do this material condition form the char their character and the institution's character? Oh, I think there's no doubt. If you're if you're if you're in a situation where you you don't have access to you know running water, you don't have access to school books, you don't have you name it, right? Clearly, that's going to have an impact on your life. It, it's, that's 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 just social social economics 101. Um, I think that in terms of COVID and its impact on 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 education globally, my, my sense, and again, after I'm going to uh, read up on this a bit, but my sense is that it's accelerating the inequalities. Um, so my sense is that uh, the COVID situation is accelerating the inequalities. It's not making things more equal. It's accelerating and has exposed the inequalities in, in, in our societies and, and, and around the world. And I think that that doesn't stop at the schoolhouse door. That is, you know, that, that also occurs in, in educational institutions. So um, if I understand the, both of those questions, um, yes, um, economics matters. Uh, before, when I was talking about the uh, critiquing neoliberalism, I wasn't critiquing it from the point of view that economics didn't matter. I was uh, critiquing it from the point of view of, of both the economic inequality and the reduction of everything to simply that which is that which that is uh, uh, gets you financially ahead. 
Um, I've, I've oversimplified there, but that, that's basically it. So yes, economics does matter, uh, and, you're, and it can have an effect on, on your character. It can, obviously it can. Um, uh, and secondly, in terms of COVID, yes, I do think it's accelerated and accentuated and widened the inequalities. I do not think that the result of this, this pandemic will be an overcoming of inequality. I basically, if you have to ask me, and I may change my mind if you have to ask me, I think it will accentuate inequality. Thank you, James. Martha, uh, I think you can say a closing uh, words, yeah, uh, of our webinar today. You can say a uh, conclusion, summary, or your opinion. Thank you. Well, I just think developing countries should beware of the values that are getting imposed on them by the Western capitalist system, that the U.S. is a great example of having the best scientists and disease control, all this stuff, but citizens that won't listen, right? They're too self-indulgent. So that's an example of how you can develop Apollo, but you're intemperate, you're immature. So knowledge needs to be tied to wisdom. And the social justice and reason, okay? They're important wake-up calls for developing countries. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, we have had very productive two hours. I actually have lots of questions I have returned, but you can see it here. Lots of comments also, but fortunately we have uh, our audience uh, also have lots of questions, so we are engaging, interacting with them. With them. I hope this is the, not the last webinar for us. I hope uh, you uh, will accept other invitation to speak. And for now, uh, I just would like to inform, and I will also speak in Indonesian a bit later, that I will sign a certificate, an electronic certificate to both of you and to any audience who request it. Jadi, terima kasih semuanya. Uh, dua jam berlalu, tidak terasa. Uh, siapa yang menginginkan sertifikat, silakan email ya. afrida 53gmailcom nanti akan kami kirim. Uh, terima kasih sekali lagi. Uh, 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 Terus ikuti acara-acara seminar yang berikutnya dengan narasumber yang ini atau yang lain nanti. So, thank you very much. Uh, please, upon us, Assalamualaikum, and see you in the next events. All the best. All Take the... care of yourself and your family. Our regards. Bye. Thank Good you. evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm, Thank I'm you. going to take a screenshot, yeah? Uh, so you can disengage. Any of you who wants to disengage, you can disengage. Yeah. At we one stage have, you had over 22, 23. Yeah, we have up to 25 just now. We have people just joining us just now. I, a friend, yeah? Faisal Hamdani, just now we have Pak Warjio. A friend from Usu, yeah? Yep. Well, nice to meet you, James. Yep, thanks. Ditto from me. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I, I'm, I'm very supportive of Syria's um, initiative. I think, you know, you can talk to people you otherwise would never get a chance to, yeah. you know, talk I know. to and listen and so, contemplate. Um, yeah, I do have, I made up a YouTube channel um, and it, It's called M. Beck PhD Philosophy, but it all of it's about the legacy of ancient Greek civilization and the era of globalization. And it has these playlists and all that. But I did actually notice that you had pictures of Southern Spain, oh, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And those are the guys that loved Aristotle, yeah. right? Yes, yes, yes. And yes. so yeah, yeah. I have been recently reading a book called Lost History. Do you know this book? Um, the Enduring Legacy, okay, Lost History, uh -huh. The Enduring Legacy of Muslim Scientists, Thinkers, uh -huh. and Artists. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know that book? I've, I've heard of it. It's, um, 
I mean, it's there's a bit of cross because I read your essay or part of it on. Um, I think if I'm correct, shoot me down if I'm wrong. Um, critiquing uh, Martha Nussbaum's um, notion of the lack of tragic of the tragic in Plato. You wrote an essay on that. Yes, I'm right. Okay, I'm not making it up. <laughs> um, and I, I thought that was interesting. And and yeah, no, there is a crossover, and that's why I mentioned that Paideia, uh, that that the concept that I that we talk about Adab and Paideia are very very similar. I'm Almost sure they actually. are. I'm sure they are. That's why I say I'm not making any claims that the Greeks are any better or any different. It's just the only one I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, no. And so, yeah, I spent 19 summers in Greece, right? And I got to know the scholars there who know the culture. And what happens is ever since Plato died, everybody co-ops them, right? I mean, it's political. So if you, you might want to make a statement by saying you hate them or you love them, you know, but it's never, why don't you read them for what they wanted to say rather than what you yeah. right want them so that is a real problem so i just i actually went to a conference once and it was famous for saying we we take many different approaches you know we're not just analytic blah blah so i said to her this woman well i try to understand plato from plato's point of view yeah, yeah. and she said well that's a thought that's a thought yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, hey, do you know what you're saying? You know, I mean, don't you want to step back and think what's happened to this profession? Yeah. Well, I'm out of it now. I'm no longer working at university, so which is both good and bad, but um, it is what it is. Although now with this COVID and the, there's going to be a lot of cutbacks, a lot of job losses, a lot of job losses. Where are you working? I, I'm not now. I'm. I, I, I used to work at university, but now I'm, uh, well, I'm really just an independent researcher. Um, but there's a huge impact of, I'm in Melbourne, by the way. And in Melbourne, we have, um, you know, mandatory face masks. Yeah. We have uh, what they call stage three uh, um which means you can go um, other businesses, but yeah, it's very serious. But the economic impact of this is huge, um, and a lot of people have lost their jobs, you know, um, and a lot is more that, people. Are these other people hanging on because they want to ask a question? I have no idea what's going on. Surya, I'm not sure. I think they're enjoying uh, both of you speaking to each other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they can though. Does anybody want to ask a question? I don't know Indonesian, but I I'm, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. So I have uh, some friends here, Pak Mara Imbang, Abu Sahrin, Abrar, yeah, Fazlur, and Sami. Oh, let me stretch yeah. my leg. Pak Saparudin Siregar. <sighs> so, Marta. Just stretching my legs, don't worry. Sure, Martha. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. James, yeah. James is a pretty special person, yeah. So he has got two PhD already, and he wants to do another one. Uh, he doesn't care about tenure. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't want to slug it out, slug it out, or suck up to anyone. <laughs> Be careful what you say, Surya. This is a public talk. Be careful no, no, what I'm you gonna, say. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, is there any more to add, James and Martha, or anyone else? Apakah ada yang mau ditanyakan atau dibicarakan yang lain? Not from me. I'm okay. Look, thanks. I I just like to thank everyone who who listened, and I hope that um. Uh, that, that it was it was interesting and I, I just um, I'm very thank uh, everyone every time you get a chance to talk to people uh, you're always always very thankful that people that you've got a, a community of, of listeners and so I just want to you know if I if I can say that um, and and otherwise I'll just say salam. Uh, James 
we have someone you met at Unimed, Pak Hairil Ansari, I think. But his pictures is not, his video is not on, yeah. Uh, sorry. Anyway, thank you very much, Martha and James. Uh, it's becoming very noisy here. It's Saturday night. Um. Uh, I will, I will uh, end my meeting now. Um, but that is the foundation of American democracy to unite reason and faith. Yeah. And when you lose it, you're going to lose your democracy because people say anything in the name of faith and they cover up all sorts of corruption. So, uh, so I really do like Ancasilla. I, I, the guys who wrote it had studied the Greeks and they studied a lot of this stuff. When I read Panchasilla, I said, my gosh, it sounds like Aristotle. Um, and I have written quite a bit about that. So, again, you got to go to bed, James. <laughs> okay. Uh, good night, everybody. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you. I, I, I do have to go. Um, yeah, in the description of the go. video later, I will include all your information, YouTube and whatnot, yeah? So see you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Good evening. Good Take care. Bye. -bye. Yeah. <laughs>